Mark chapter 9 begins with a well-known and unfortunate prophecy. I tell you the truth, there are some standing here who will not experience death before they see the kingdom of God come with power. The break that was imposed between Mark chapter 8 and chapter 9 is unfortunate but probably deliberate. The beginning of Mark 9 follows on from the end of Mark 8, so I'll backtrack to Mark 8.34. Then Jesus called the crowd along with his disciples and said to them, If anyone wants to become my follower, he must deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life because of me and because of the gospel will save it. For what benefit is it for a person to gain the whole world yet forfeit his life? What can a person give in exchange for his life? For if anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. And he said to them, I tell you the truth, there are some standing here who will not experience death before they see the kingdom of God come with power. A prediction that has led to a great deal of discussion and theorising about what Jesus meant by will not experience death and what was meant by see the kingdom of God come with power. Current dating puts this gospel around the year 70, and this prediction is one of the reasons why it's not dated much later than 70, because the events it supposedly recounts occurred around the year 30. That would give this prophecy a pretty short expiration date even in the year 70, assuming we're taking its plain meaning. And this has prompted a number of interpretations of what the meaning really was. A theory that has some traction on the internet and in popular culture is that Jesus and Christianity were inventions of the Roman government and this prediction about seeing the kingdom of God come with power was referring to the arrival of Vespasian and Titus on the scene who proved victorious in the Judeo-Roman war culminating in 70 AD. That, however, is not a theory that has gained credibility in scholarship. The Christian interpretation is that seeing the kingdom of God refers either to the resurrection or to the events that occurred at Pentecost described in Acts. But the fact that the chapter division was placed where it was suggests that the editor who did this tried to connect it with the next section, which was the Transfiguration, when really it belongs to the previous one. Verse 2. Six days later Jesus took with him Peter, James and John and led them alone up a high mountain privately. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became radiantly white, more so than any launderer in the world could bleach them. Then Elijah appeared before them, along with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. So Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, is it good for us to be here? Let us make three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. For they were afraid, and he did not know what to say. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came from the cloud, This is my one dear son, listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them any more except Jesus. It has been suggested that this scene was moved here from later in the Gospel, specifically a post-resurrection scene, or inserted after the Gospel was written to defuse the tension about the prophecy that some standing here will not see death before they see the Kingdom of God. That seems unlikely because the cast of the Transfiguration that is, Jesus, Elijah, Moses and the voice of God, doesn't match the cast of the prophecy, which is Jesus, the power of God, and angels. The more likely purpose of the transfiguration is to underline Jesus' special spiritual nature. Peter's suggestion about the shelters is a reference to the Feast of Tabernacles, but he erred in suggesting equal status for all three participants, as underlined by the voice saying, This is my one dear son, Listen to him. Verse 9. As they were coming down from the mountain, he gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. They kept this statement to themselves, discussing what this rising from the dead meant. So now both of the things that the staged blind man's recovery was indicating have been expressed explicitly. That is, the nature of Jesus and his terminal prognosis. Then in verse 11 there is an explanation of why Elijah had pitched up. Then they asked him, why do the experts in the law say that Elijah must come first? He said to them, Elijah does indeed come first and restores all things. And why is it written that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be despised? But I tell you that Elijah has certainly come, and they did to him whatever they wanted, just as it is written about him. 
If you're confused by verses 11 to 13, you're in good company. They don't make a lot of sense. Verse 14. When they came to the disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and experts in the law arguing with them. When the whole crowd saw him, they were amazed and ran at once and greeted him. He asked them, What are you arguing about with them? A member of the crowd said to him, Teacher, I brought you my son who is possessed by a spirit that makes him mute. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him down and he foams at the mouth, grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to cast it out, but they were not able to do so. He answered them, You unbelieving generation, how much longer must I be with you? How much longer must I endure you? Bring him to me. So they brought the boy to him. When the spirit saw him, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell on the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked his father, How long has this been happening to him? And he said, From childhood. It has often thrown him into fire or water to destroy him. But if you are able to do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Then Jesus said to him, If you are able... All things are possible for one who believes. Immediately the father of the boy cried out and said, I believe, help my unbelief. Now when Jesus saw that a crowd was quickly gathering, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, Mute and deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. It shrieked and threw him into a terrible convulsion and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said, He is dead. But Jesus gently took his hand and raised him to his feet, and he stood up. Then, after he went into the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why couldn't we cast it out? He told them, This kind can come out only by prayer. So Jesus, Peter, James and John were the only people who had gone up to the transfiguration scene. When they returned back down, the remaining disciples were arguing with experts of the law. The disagreement had arisen over the disciples' failure to cast out an evil spirit. Jesus then does the honours, and there are a couple of things to note here. Firstly, the boy's father's faith is faulty, and this nearly costs him the miracle. But then he asks specifically for health with his faith as well as with his son. I believe, help my unbelief, has become an iconic phrase in Christianity. We know from chapter 6 verse 13 that the disciples were able to cast out unclean spirits. But we learn here that unclean spirits can be classified into different types, and the required methods of exorcism vary with the type. That seems a reasonable explanation, but it does make Jesus' exasperation with this generation's lack of faith rather unreasonable, since apparently faith alone wasn't good enough for this kind of demon, and it required prayer. Verse 30, They went out from there and passed through Galilee. But Jesus did not want anyone to know, for he was teaching his disciples and telling them, The Son of Man will be betrayed into the hands of men. They will kill him, and after three days he will rise but they did not understand this statement and were afraid to ask him. Then they came to Capernaum, and after Jesus was inside the house, he asked them, What were you discussing on the way? But they were silent, for on the way they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. After he sat down, he called the twelve and said to them, If anyone wants to be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. He took a little child and had him stand among them. Taking him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me does not welcome me but the one who sent me. John said to him, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, Do not stop him, because no one who does a miracle in my name will be able soon afterwards to say anything bad about me. For whoever is not against us is for us. For I tell you the truth, whoever gives you a cup of water because you bear Christ's name will never lose his reward. If anyone causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a huge millstone tied round his neck and be thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than to have two hands and go into hell to the unquenchable fire. If your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better to enter life lame than to have two feet and be thrown into hell. If your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It is better to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than have two eyes and be thrown into hell, where their worm never dies and the fire is never quenched. Everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, 
but if it loses its saltiness, how can you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with each other. That's the end of chapter 9. I would assume that the argument about who's the greatest among the disciples is simply a plot device to bring Jesus onto the subject of humility in children, as Mark has them remaining silent, relying on Jesus' telepathic abilities to know what they've been saying. The discussion of the value of humility, and particularly of children, is part of another Markian sandwich that continues in chapter 10. An interesting thing about this passage is that it contains Mark's only description of hell. He tells us of unquenchable fire, everlasting worms, and everyone salted with fire, whatever that means. This is our earliest Christian description of hell. Paul mentions hell a couple of times, but he doesn't give any details at all. But from Mark we have unquenchable fire, eternal and presumably refractory worms, and salt. Also, the last couple of verses of this chapter suggest a recurrence of the flight of ideas psychiatric symptom that we've seen before. Salt is initially something bad to make suffering greater, but then, oh, it's something good. And then this strange reference to salt losing its taste, all placed on the lips of Jesus. Jesus. 